Good morning. I'm really excited to be here today because I get to talk to you guys about one of my favorite topics, chaos and disruption. And there's going to be plenty of that. So what's being disrupted? And at the core, it's the nature of the relationship between suppliers and their customers. If we think about it historically, customers were always looking to mostly the folks in this room for guidance in technology, for guidance in innovation. When I needed to do something, I came to you. I put out an RFP, we built a project plan, we went through this waterfall implementation methodology. I bought, you sold. Those days are done, absolutely done. Your customers have figured out they're holding the cards in this new world. Can't do AI with code, it takes data. Who's got the data? The customers. Can't do predictive without data. Who's got the data? Your customers. Can't do fraud analytics without transactions, without cash flow, without customers. Who's got the data? Your buyers. This is going to be the decade where we look back and we say, this is when buyers demanded their seat at the table. Where buyers didn't just become your customers, they became your partners and your competitors. And this is going to be a fascinating decade for us. So, so let's talk a little bit about kind of how we're going to approach this. So first we'll start with a discussion of what is an industry cloud? What do we mean when we use that term? Why do customers care? Okay, why is this a topic that really has become central to many of our largest end user customers as they think about their development as organizations? What drives growth here? And then probably most importantly, some guidance. What can you do to make sure that you participate in this market, minimize the disruption of your existing operations, and hopefully even thrive and succeed in this new marketplace? So what is an industry cloud? There's a very typical, very detailed IDC definition on the slide, but I'll tell you how I think about it. Industry cloud environments for the technologists in the room could be thought of maybe as something we could describe as PaaS plus plus. Okay, PaaS, platform as a service, everything I need to operate a platform. Plus, industry standard transaction support. Okay, if I'm healthcare, that means HIPAA. If I'm banking, that may mean regulatory compliance. If I'm in the government, it means appropriate FedRAMP compliance. And then security. We heard Frank talk about the cloud is kind of the new secure operating investment going forward. So in every industry, there is an opportunity for a platform that's been tailored to that industry. That tailoring allows us to work through APIs to attach easily to services to consume data in the form of answers versus drinking from the fire hose and figuring it out ourselves. Now there's an extra twist on this. When the customers recognize that they can share data among themselves without the assistance of a technology provider. One of the first places we saw this was in healthcare, in oncology research. I don't need vendors to help me do cancer research. The doctors in my facilities do cancer research. I need technologists to help us share data. So that Dana Farmer and Memorial Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson can actually share their data in a collaborative way. Well, in the old market, we would have gone and found a vendor to hook us all up. In the new world, they create a JV. They send out RFPs to you guys, and they ask you what you're willing to invest in a new organization to have the privilege of being their platform supplier. A whole new market. Your customers want to be your partners, and they expect you to pay for that privilege. And they're going to get you to do it. You're not going to have a choice. And we'll talk about why as we go along here. Collaborative clouds, though, exist in a lot of other places. Regulatory compliance. 
Think about the banks. Sorbanes-Oxley comes out. Every major North American bank goes and engages with a systems integrator and a technology crew, lays out, I don't know, 40, 50, 80, 100 million dollars to become compliant, and then pays to own and operate that code moving forward. Banks kind of feel like they get the short end of the stick on this, because they know that next year it's Dodd-Frank. And what happens the year after that? And this has become an investment treadmill for these guys. So suppose the banks got together and said, you know what? Compliance doesn't create a competitive advantage. Compliance is an expense that we all pay for. Why don't we pool that? Why don't we all benefit from all the data that we hold? And why don't we minimize our investment here? And every bank CEO smiled. And every systems integrator partner in New York screamed in pain. All right? This is the market we're in. And we'll talk about some of these examples. There are many, many cases where end users are interested in sharing data to collaborate on generating better answers. And again, these problem sets, these use cases, are going to the cloud very quickly at a very different pricing and consumption model for the suppliers than a traditional implementation. So you have to think about what is your role? Are you going to be a founder and principal? Are you going to go out and actually solicit your customers with a partnership discussion? Are you going to hope to be a platform supplier there? Are you going to operate as a SaaS partner and participate in many of these platforms via APIs? Are you going to provide information to them? Are you going to become one of these third-party brokers that brings information into these environments? Or are you going to work in the developer community? And most industry cloud platforms, again, as, as Frank has shown, have developer portals and developer communities already. I think the biggest surprise for many when we talk to them is the fact that they don't understand how mature a movement this is. They don't understand that this is already a five-year-old market, that there are already hundreds of major participants out here. Because these are not IT suppliers. These are suppliers that sell to the line of business. Many of the user organizations I work with that participate in these clouds, the CIO isn't even aware of it. It's something line of business is doing through a contractual relationship around data and process. And it's been fascinating to watch. So we'll come back in the essential guidance with some tips uh, to help you make some of these decisions. But this is one of the biggest strategic decisions that face many of you over the next several years. How are you going to attack and participate in this market? So why do customers care? Why are they fascinated by this? Why are they engaged in it? Why is every one of the Global 500 have an internal initiative to understand and address these new opportunities? Well, there are four principal reasons. The search for new revenue models, the need to digitally transform, the requirement to bring more innovation and agility into our business and to remediate risk, and all these new technologies we need to come up to speed on, all the innovation accelerators. IoT, artificial intelligence, probably being the biggest two in this area, but all of them playing a role here. All of them having their own unique issues around skill shortages, okay, around maturity, around best practices. And again, collaborative efforts move the ball forward faster there. And companies are beginning to realize this. So four big drivers here. So let's walk through those. Revenue models. Three revenue models for in, in the industry cloud market that we've identified. Participants really engaging in all three right now. Probably the best known is Predix. Um, Predix certainly wasn't the first of these that I looked at, but um, Imelt is, uh, is a pretty bright guy when it comes to marketing and promotion. And Predix is probably one of the only industry clouds you have heard about because it's been widely marketed to help elevate the whole brand at GE Digital. Predix is an architecture, it's not a product. And you're going to see Predix like products, like they use for aviation, 
and power plants now in every part of their business. There'll be a predix for medical imaging. There'll be a predix for diagnosticians in health. There'll be a predix for every major market GE serves in one form or another. And GE Digital is running this as a commercialization platform and they're bringing their customers in. They're already in full-blown JV, my buyers are now suppliers, how am I going to create a channel that we can both benefit from? And this is really important. So this is an information-driven model. All right, GE is collecting, aggregating, building intelligence out of information, reducing your cost of ownership and your uptime. These are by far the most popular of the early models here. But there are several others. Operations driven. So we look at Athena Health. Athena did a JV with Beth Israel. So if you think about healthcare, it's a lot like ERP and other markets. You buy a vanilla product and then you spend three to five times what you spend on the software to make it fit your organization. So when a healthcare organization buys a clinical support package, an electronic medical record system, it comes without documentation around how do the clinicians enter and use data. All that has to be developed. Every implementation is different, just like ERP. Very expensive to own, very expensive to operate, very fragile, very rigid. And if you're a small community hospital, debt funded by a bond issue, probably well beyond your reach. So you're running poor technology, you're on an older platform, you have poor security, you really can't participate in the new marketplace at all. Well, now I have an answer for you. Throw your system away. Put your users on Athena's cloud, and by default, they will operate the Beth Israel model. Beth Israel's documentation, Beth Israel's clinical processes, Beth Israel reporting, Beth Israel compliance. Best in class. Debt riddled community hospital can save money by becoming a best in class organization from a technology perspective. It's almost magical, right? And this is what happens when we bring data along with technology. And then finally, we have pure technology driven. So NITC, the National Information Technology Center, is a kind of breakaway IT group within the Department of Interior. They're smarter than the average bears. They understood what was happening to traditional IT. They looked out into the cloud and they decided collectively, we can do this or we can fail. We can sit around and wait to be outsourced, wait to be fed ramped, wait to be displaced. Or we can actually get out there and use what we know about federal to create a set of information services that's better than what any vendor can offer. So NITC, in effect, formed FedRAMP as a service, right? federally compliant cloud services as a service delivered from within Interior. Plus they added green, plus they added sustainability, which meets some other federal guidelines that pop them right up the procurement list. And so now Interior is aggregating federal IT business from other agencies. And they're offering back federally compliant platform services as a service. Kind of an interesting approach in industry cloud within an IT shop. But they're doing it for the same reason all of these companies are doing it. They're buying innovation. Okay, they're buying innovation out of the cloud that they can't quickly create in their own environments. And the competition moving forward will be based heavily on digital innovation. Every company is a software company. Doesn't matter what your product is, you're gonna digitally enhance it. If you're a product company, there's a digital stream around better using the product, creating a better ownership experience, creating a better maintenance experience, creating a better cost to value equation for the customer. If you're a services company, the same thing. Okay. Every software about the service. What have I received? What's value? Okay, imagine getting a scorecard every time you interact with a service provider. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be fascinating? I'm, I'm so old, I go back to the days when I was a consultant, we took classes on fee fatigue. 
Okay, how do you make a customer pay their monthly bill when they don't perceive that they saw progress? This is a big thing in this SI community. Every partner that you ever met has taken the same class on fee fatigue. This is one of the ways we, we mitigate that. Now I get a report. This is what happened today. This is what we accomplished. This is how you compare to others. This is what you should do next. Every product we offer, whether it's a physical good or a service, is now going to be digitally enhanced by data. Digitally enhanced to create more value in the eyes of the customer. Innovation, we've talked about this a lot. I love this simple equation. Frank had it up, but I'm going to hit you with it again. Innovation equals code plus data. This is the magic. This is the macroeconomic inflection point we talk about a decade from now. This is when customers demanded their seat at the table and they said, guess what? My data is worth as much or more than your code. And I want a contract that reflects that. You're going to go try to implement an AI system with a healthcare provider, a government provider, a manufacturer. Guess what? That source code is worthless without data. Can't do anything. This was one of the great discoveries in the early days of Watson, right? We went to sell Watson to technology and it was kind of a slog. It was a tough haul. People don't want technology. They want answers. IBM went out and blew about three and a half billion dollars on a company full of data in health called Truven. Now they have their own data. Their own data plus their own code, that equals innovation. Most of you are going to have to go to customers for data. If you have an AI strategy and it doesn't include how you're going to aggregate data from most of your customers, you will fail. There is no AI without data. Okay? It's like mobile. There's no mobile if there's no one at the end of the device, right? If the phone rings and no one answers, so how do you make that mobile interaction sticky? How do you make people look at their phone? You give them something of value. That takes data. This is the fundamentally new equation in the digital economy that everyone has to come to grips with. Data is every bit as valuable as code, and every one of you is going to have to make your peace with that. Industry cloud platforms are going to be the primary route to market. And to me, this is a, a fascinating thing. Think about internet. Think about the early days of internet. It was technology, right? I remember sitting at home teaching myself HTML, feeling like it was magic. But it was just technology. What two things made the internet really go? Data and a recognition that the internet wasn't a content management tool. It wasn't the browser. It wasn't HTML. It was a channel. So who figured out that the internet was a channel? Amazon. Where is Amazon now? Right? And we could talk about examples of people that looked at the internet and instead of seeing a browser, they saw a channel and how successful they became. This is exactly the same case. Industry clouds start as economic discussions, as technology discussions, but at the end of the day, they're channels to market. And because of that, we treat them differently. You don't do ROI on a channel. You invest. You don't treat a channel like technology. You look at it as a business asset. And that's what's going to happen in this community. So we have new KPIs. We'll talk about this a little. I think Sandra will show you the view of these from Asia. But what we measure our organizations on is changing. And how leadership looks at these organizations is changing. And I won't drill into all of these. The one that's important to us in the context of this conversation is right in the middle here. 100% growth of revenue from information-based products. Every product company is looking for a digital revenue stream in support of those products. Every organization services and products are looking for how they create new digital revenue streams based on information. And this has moved this topic right up to the top of the agenda in many of our industrial customers. 
And the leaders are already moving. Um, recently, we did a study of CDOs and their plans to monetize data. So this is a large global bank, and they're saying we're moving towards data as a product or a saleable commodity to be able to monetize the data that we have. Every major North American bank has a program like this now. Every global bank, every exchange, every commodity exchange, every stock exchange, everyone is moving to monetize the data that they have. And they've all realized that their data is every bit as valuable as their code. Third reason of innovation, agility, and risk, we gotta go quick. Nobody's got 18 to 24 months to wait for a new implementation. Have to go quick. 90-day pilots, 180-day implementation cycles, this is kind of the new normal. Not only do we have to go quick, we're abandoning the traditional process. CIO controls less than half the budget in most of my industrial accounts at this point. Line of business is free to fund IT or to go outside. And that's really become the new normal. IT does not get the first bite of the apple, and IT is not the only way that I can implement technology. We'll come back to this in a minute. You can't sell to the line of business with your CIO sales force and your CIO sales message. They don't care about SKUs and speeds and feeds. They just don't care. Solution-centric, answer-based, service-level driven. It's a whole new world. And as a service really does become the dominant delivery model for most of us. And it just gets worse when we think about the innovation accelerators. Really our final thing here. How do we do this? Where do we get the skills? Where do we get the resources? Where do we get the data? All right, you're implementing your first IoT system. Where do you get the data to run a system test? You're gonna write it all by hand? Really? No, you're gonna work with someone that already has some. You're gonna figure that out. Very difficult to do a traditional systems implementation in the area of AI and IoT, AR, VR. Specialized skills, specialized data, all kinds of reasons. End users might want to collaborate on developing this technology internally, quickly. And you notice many of these are data dependent. All right, it's very difficult for a technology supplier to do this on their own. You need a customer to test with, you need a customer to pilot with, there's just no way around that. Um, and now customers, of course, understand the value of the data they bring to that process. So they're gonna expect a seat at the table. And then there's the whole issue of scale. Even if I have all the data for one customer, it might be enough. These are big multi-company environments we're talking about here. We'll talk about some financial services issues that have the whole banking industry engaged. How do I simulate that? How do I test that? It's very hard. And it's very hard for me to service it. Where do I get enough experts to go out and talk to all those accounts? Where do I get enough implementation people to go out and install them? And on the buy side, where do they get the talent to evaluate you and execute those agreements? So the whole market stalls on the skill shortage and on the newness and the traditional model. It'll go much faster in the cloud and, and as a service. So lots of reasons that innovation accelerators just kind of pour gasoline on the fire here. So if we look at the opportunity, we have new business models driven by digital transformation. We have new technology in the form of the innovation accelerators. We have new business requirements around competition and compliance. And then right in the middle of that, we have all of this new capability we're trying to come to speed on. I mean, think about this. All right, a really common project in my government business right now, cameras on cops. Okay, everybody's kind of familiar with that, right? It's been in the paper forever. We're at a point now where we want our law enforcement officers to have cameras and to record their interaction with citizens. Anyone here think there's one chief of police in the entire United States capable and competent enough to pull off that deployment? Information retention, security, management of all these devices in the field, data integrity, 
completely beyond the capability of even the best law enforcement leaders. My recent experience, totally beyond the capabilities of town administrators. Town IT people are, are lost. Even state people, even big states, like New York and California don't have a good plan here. Nobody wants to implement this, nobody wants to own this, and the whole initiative is stalled. What's happening? States are going out and picking an as-a-service supplier. They're creating purchasing agreements for all the cities and counties within their state. This is all gonna happen as a service. Okay, you won't find any of this on-prem. You won't find any of this purchased in the old model off a website or through a catalog. All of this comes as a service by a provider. And it happens very quickly that way. Well, cameras on cops is one of a hundred things that we're trying to do there. If you think about the broader smart city, we're putting cameras everywhere. We're instrumenting every piece of public transportation. We're identifying and tracking assets. Again, all beyond the capability of the typical IT professional within these organizations. So what's happening? They're standing up industry clouds. We just finished uh, several projects in Europe and, and the Middle East. We have a, a number going on in the US where the goal is, in effect, to create a cloud where all the services that manage the smart city and all the data produced by those services sits in a cloud. The municipalities now are thinking about, how do I commercialize all this data? All this data about movement, about traffic, about consumption, about safety, about how citizens interact with the environment, this is all valuable. Even cities and towns are thinking about how they commercialize this data now. Every industry is going through the same process, and especially for these solution areas in the colored circles in the middle, industry clouds are, are I believe, out the gate, the preferred solution approach for customers. These are some of the very first markets where industry clouds aren't replacing, okay? They are the preferred solution from day one. These are, in effect, industry cloud natives. And it's gonna be fascinating to watch. This happens mostly in the verticals, life sciences and healthcare, very aggressive. And again, it's the collaborative, non-competitive nature that really led them to do this. I'll tell you, the first organization that got me thinking about this five years ago was Optum Health. Optum is an interesting organization, so Frank showed us McKesson on the fortune list. You notice the company right underneath that was United Healthcare. Okay. United, as, as old and conservative a company as you're gonna find. All right. 40 years of being in the healthcare payer business. All right. They're a health payer not typically renowned for their technology, right? Paper forms, IBM mainframes, and that industry does still really have quite a bit of that going on. 40-year-old data, or 40-year-old organization, 40 million lives of data. Think about that. 10 years ago, what would that have looked like? It looked like this, a huge liability that I had to drag along. Petabytes of data. All right, and every year I invested in my storage farm, and every year I invested in my archiving strategy, and I got nothing out of it. I treated it as a liability. It was just money I had to spend. Then they created a company called Ingenix, and they turned that liability into an asset, and they started producing interesting data about outcomes, about value, about managing the formulary, the drugs that, that are insured can and cannot get based on value. They started looking at personalized and translational medicine. Where are the pockets to get this care based on some biometric data, some genomic data? It's fascinating. So Ingenix became Optum and now Optum One. Their product became so strong that every near market competitor they have has to buy it. Think about how Aetna and Cigna and Kaiser all kind of choke a little when they have to write that check to Optum. And Optum did what I think you guys have to be most concerned about. Optum went from being a buyer of storage to becoming a supplier of analytics. They used IT to become an answers as a service company. And now none of their near market competitors are investing in that space anymore. They're not buying hardware, they're not buying storage, they're not adding compute, they're not hiring people. They're simply consuming that capability from Optum. 
it's not all upside. Parts of the old market go away forever. So you have to ask yourself, is this core to my business? Am I willing to work with competitors? What are some of the low-hanging spaces? And I'll tell you right now, the lowest of the low-hanging fruit, regulatory compliance and IoT. So let's talk about a couple of examples here to make this a little more real. The PowerShare network. This is Nuance Technologies, Nuance medical imaging vendor. Again, medical imaging, one of these tough categories. Used to be easy. All right, used to show up at the hospital and every year they grew their storage farm 20%. No more. Medical imaging is now in the cloud. I don't want to store it. I don't want to own the spindles. I don't want to manage the raised floor. Put my medical imaging in the cloud. So first, this business started as a capacity value play, just like virtualization. Make some cost go away. But when we put that in the industry cloud model, now we've got to create value out of data. So how do we do that? Well, Nuance went out and did a partnership with the ACR, okay, the, the American uh, College of Radiology, and Mass General Hospital, Partners Healthcare. ACR delivered best practices. This is how you manage a set of digital images used in health. Radiology, digital x-rays, CAT, PET, MRI. Here are the best practices. Here's how we recommend they be done. Here's guidance. Here's instruction. Partners had a whole set of algorithms around error correction and automatic discovery. Algorithms are better at finding breast cancer than, than people right now. And there are a number of states where machines can do a better job interrogating a digital image than the human eye. Put those three things together, and it's no longer capacity as a service. It's knowledge and value and answers as a service. Whole different set of equations here. Whole different macroeconomic expression from the eyes of the customer. Oh, and by the way, three billion images from 1,800 hospitals. I don't care. I want the algorithms to get smart. I don't care if they get smart on my data, or on Beth Israel's data, or on the University of Pittsburgh's data, or on Kaiser's data. I want that algorithm to be smart for everyone. And many of these organizations don't really compete directly, so it's been easier in health. But there's a lot of common ground in every industry. Next example, Clarent. This is the one that I think is probably most obvious, the disruption going on here. Look at these customers. Look at those logos. Every vendor in this room would love to have that book of business. There isn't one of you that would turn down one of these accounts. And if you want them, you'd start thinking about a seven, eight figure pipeline into there to sell technology. And every time one of these banks got a new compliance initiative, again, we talked about Sorbanes Oxley and Dodd-Frank, you know, it's like an angel got its wings, right? Some system integrator became a partner on that project. You know, you hear the bell ring, boom, you're a partner. You have a $100 million project to manage. Uh, partners don't like what's happening here now. So if you were a systems integration partner, you know, one of these companies, if you own the compliance work, that was a gravy train. You were going to live there till you retired. You were going to do really well. Well, these guys have figured this out too. They're tired of making compliance investments every year and then having to do all the hard work on top of that of loading it up with data. So these guys got together in the face of a new set of regulations around any money laundering and know your customer. Who is the legal entity? Who sits behind the shell company? They put all their data together just for onboarding, just for regulatory compliance, just to reduce the number of bad actors in the system overall. They did it in the form of Clarent, an industry cloud. They're inviting other banks to join. There are two price rates, use the service, use the service and contribute your data. The vendors are low level partners in this. You notice there's not a technology supplier listed here. They're behind the scenes. They're being purchased professionally. But what happened here? Okay, six, seven, 10, 12, 14 big accounts just went away. They're not going to buy one new server. They're not going to write one loon line of code. They're not going to hire one hour of systems integration time because they're doing it in the JV, not in the data center, not behind the firewall. And they're commercializing it and they're turning it into a revenue producing activity. 
a whole new model for IT. So, and then finally, uh, I'm sorry, wrong way, DEAR. So DEAR, pretty straightforward, um, Sage Insights, they're collecting data off their tractors. They're turning that into a better understanding of what's being planted. And they're creating proactive advice for the farmer about how to make more money. So again, three examples here where data plus code really does equal innovation. So in two years, a lot of market growth happening. Okay, we, we moved to about 500, 450, 500 providers in this space. Compliance clouds really take over. All of you, I believe, in the five-year time frame are going to be dealing with industry clouds in the area of financial compliance and financial payments. And then finally, in 10 years, we see this broad-based understanding that buyers really have become suppliers. Okay, so you heard it here first. So you have to ask yourself, are you in the game? Can you talk to a line of business buyer? Can you hold your own in the verticals? Are you selling SKUs or service levels? And this is going to become a really important decision. A line of business guy never bought a box or a spindle or an interface or an interconnect in their whole life. They only buy capability. So what can you do? What's the essential guidance here? You need to be in the game here. If your strategy isn't underway, if you're not actively thinking and acting here, you are behind in no uncertain terms. Because a number of the big dogs are already moving. You have to think about your partnering JV strategy. Nobody here has been really successful on their own. Vendors need end users, and end users need vendors. There's no way around this. All right, this is a problem that can only be solved by the two of you together. Code isn't enough. You need data. So go mine your customer base. Go figure out whoever, who's likely to do this. Go find the supply chain captains, the industry leaders in your customer base, and take the idea to them. They're not thinking about this. So the third thing, get out there in front of them. Bring this idea to your customers. Don't hide from it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't hope it doesn't happen to you, because it will. Get out there and be on the front edge of it. Pay close attention to what's going on in your important verticals. This is a first mover market. It's hard to be number two here. Okay, if the first mover goes and gets the data from the top two or three firms in an industry, it's going to be tough to compete with them. Big first mover advantage here. I can't stress that enough. Look at what GE has done. Look at what Optum has done. It's going to be very hard to go out and compete with them in those particular spaces now. And finally, IoT cognitive and compliance are the low-hanging fruit here. Honestly, you can't do any of these things without large volumes of customer data. They're perfect opportunities to develop these businesses. They have obvious economic models. They're obvious advantages to end users of doing this. There are plenty of examples of, of first movers in the market going already. It's not a hard pitch in these spaces, but you've got to get out in front of it, and you have to be that first mover in your market. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll be here all day, and I'm happy to take any questions you have over the course of the day. Thank you so much.